many other uh, This is great, uh, Arab. Welcome back. Thanks very much for staying on with us here on We On World Is One. You're watching the latest coming in from around the world with me, Molly Gambhir. A quick look first at the top stories making headlines. Austria goes back into a lockdown from Monday, making it the first country in the European Union to bring back stringent measures as COVID-19 cases continue to rise. Germany plunges into a national emergency as COVID-19 cases surge, harsher restrictions imposed for the unvaccinated. Amid the growing chorus for updates on the whereabouts of the Chinese tennis star Peng Shuai, now the United Nations steps in demanding the proof of the tennis star's well-being. After weeks of border clashes with migrants, Belarus moves thousands of migrants away from the Polish border. This as hundreds of Iraqis fly back to Iraq in the first repatriation flight since August. Large parts of the world witnessed the longest partial lunar eclipse since 1440. The eclipse which resulted in almost entire surface area of the moon reddening due to scattering of light led to people describing it as the blood moon. U.S. President Joe Biden has confirmed that the country is considering a diplomatic boycott of the upcoming Beijing Olympics. The move aims to protest against China's human rights record, especially its treatment of the Uyghur Muslims in Xinjiang. Sir, do you support a diplomatic boycott of the Beijing Olympics? Something we're considering. Joe Biden made this statement when he sat down for a meeting with the Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau. A diplomatic boycott would mean that U.S. officials would not attend the opening of the Beijing Olympics. A diplomatic boycott would not affect the athletes. Joe Biden recently held a virtual summit with the Chinese President Xi Jinping, the first extensive round of talks between the two leaders since Biden took office in January this year. Soon after Biden's recent statement, the White House press secretary has clarified that the issue was not discussed during the virtual summit, also saying that there was no defined timeline for the decision. The president's homeland security advised with investor protection and fair and efficient markets. Moving forward with the process of and get the vaccine in the arms of Americans. So there's. Uh, it doesn't say anything about the meeting. Uh, they didn't talk about the Olympics during the meeting. It wasn't a topic that was discussed during the meeting. I would note that we've said from the beginning, the beginning of this administration, as it relates to how we engage with China, that we see it through the prism of competition, not conflict. I certainly understand the question. I, I just want to give the national security team and the president a space to make the decision, so I can't give you a prediction of a timeline. Activists and members of the Congress have been pressing the Biden administration to diplomatically boycott the Winter Olympics, which will be held in February. Top lawmakers across party lines, including the Republican Senator Mitt Romney and the U.S. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi, have supported this idea. This is to make a statement against human rights violations in China's Xinjiang province, which many countries call genocide. Last week, the U.S. Secretary of State Anthony Blinken said that Washington was in conversation with countries around the world to see what they think about participation.
And for more on the uh, latest coming in from elsewhere, handing it back uh, to my colleague Nick Harper from Washington. Nick? Hello and welcome to the live broadcast from Washington, D.C. Next on today's show, in what is known as the Three Amigos Summit, the United States hosted its North American neighbours, Mexico and Canada, for the first time since 2016. However, tensions on trade and immigration lurked in the background of the meeting at the White House. Canada and Mexico were at cross swords with the US during Donald Trump's presidency. The issues mainly revolved around trade tariffs for Canada and immigration for Mexico. Now, Joe Biden is trying to restore ties between the three countries. Our North American vision for the future draws on our shared strengths as well as three vibrant democracies with dynamic populations and economy wishing to work together. We, that we can, be, uh, we can meet today uh, and we can meet all the challenges if we just take the time to speak with one another by working together. And we have to end the pandemic and to take decisive actions to curb the climate crisis. Canadian PM Justin Trudeau termed the ties between the three countries as extremely strong. But concerns were raised about Biden's proposal for a tax credit encouraging U.S. production of electric vehicles. The tax credit is included in the $1.75 trillion U.S. Build Back Better legislation. Canada has also called the Buy America initiative from the United States in the automobile sector an undisguised protectionism. We've been highlighting our concern around the proposed electric vehicle credit uh, for vehicle electric vehicles uh, uniquely made in the United States and the impact it would have on Canadian jobs and the Canadian auto industry at a time where we are investing significantly uh, in uh, the kinds of uh, zero emission vehicles that the world is going to need in the coming years. Um, I highlighted over the course of these past two days in many, many different conversations Canada's real concerns uh, about the impact it would have not just on the industry in Canada but on uh, the integrated uh, industry and workers on both sides of the border. And we're going to continue to do the work necessary to not just highlight our position but find solutions. Meanwhile, Mexico called for the United States to buy North American instead of adopting protectionist measures. Mexico's biggest concern remains the immigration issue at the U.S. southern borders. President Biden, ningún mandatario en la historia de Estados Unidos ha manifestado como usted un compromiso tan claro e inequívoco para mejorar la situación de los migrantes y le expreso por ello mi reconocimiento me refiero particularmente a su propuesta de regularizar la situación migratoria de 11 millones de personas que viven y trabajan honradamente en esta gran nación the White House also announced agreements to develop a North American strategy to fight climate change and recovery measures from the COVID-19 pandemic. The North American countries plan to reduce methane emissions as well. A pledge was made by the countries to donate COVID-19 vaccines to Latin American and Caribbean countries. A follow-up meeting will be held in Mexico next year. Next, Canada is facing the most devastating impact of climate change. 18,000 people stranded, roads and houses destroyed, and several regions inundated. This could be Canada's costliest natural disaster. So let's tell you what has unfolded so far. The record downpour has blocked off entire towns in British Columbia, and Canada's largest port in Vancouver has been completely off from the rest of the country. It's extremely worrying for the rescue officials because all connectivity routes have become inaccessible. Global supply chains have come to a standing halt. Many of the affected towns are also in mountainous areas which has complicated rescue operations further. The Premier of British Columbia has already declared a state of emergency. Province officials have also asked for urgent help from the central government. At one point, the city of Abbotsford 
feared that the water would overwhelm the pumping station, which could have forced the evacuation of 160,000 residents. But the good news is that the flood water is receding in some parts, which has helped the reopening of some of the major highways in the area. Parts of British Columbia are also facing a fuel shortage. Officials are mulling over importing fuel from the United States or from the neighbouring province of Alberta. The climate crisis has also given birth to panic buying, even though the province's agricultural minister has assured that food supply has been secured. Please do not hoard items. What you need, your neighbours need as well. We are confident that we can restore our supply chains in a quick and orderly manner, provided we all act as we have been acting over the past two years. Responding to challenges like this in a collaborative, cooperative way to make sure that everyone can come through this in one piece. These are very challenging times. I don't need to say that I've been at this Dias over the past two years talking about the challenges we've faced, unprecedented challenges with public health, wildfires, heat domes, and now debilitating floods that we have never seen before. Financially, British Columbia's Mayor Henry Braun is already working on a bill which will be presented in the House. He said that repairing local damages could cost up to $792 million. Back in the capital, Ottawa, the Prime Minister Justin Trudeau has deployed the Canadian Air Force to help with rescue and relief operations. Hundreds of Air Force officials are also on their way. Thousands more have also been put on standby. It's being called a once-in-a-500-year event, triggered by just two days of torrential rains. It's being hit by one natural calamity after another. It has been a tough year for the residents of British Columbia. Just this summer, the same region suffered a record-high heat wave. The temperatures soared to 43 degrees Celsius. As the heat broke records, more than 500 people died. Next, in a major development that could help calm the crisis on the European Union's eastern border, Belarus authorities cleared the main camps where migrants had huddled at the border with Poland. Meanwhile, the European Commission and Germany rejected a Belarus proposal that EU countries take in 2,000 of the migrants currently on its territory. The United States has accused Minsk of making migrants pawns in its efforts to be disruptive signalling that tensions with the West are far from over. Hundreds of Iraqis who'd camped for weeks in freezing conditions on the European Union's doorstep, now flying back to Iraq. Organised by Baghdad, and one of several signs that the crisis between the EU and Belarus over thousands of migrants stuck on their border could finally be easing. On Thursday, the Polish government confirmed that Belarus authorities have cleared the two main camps migrants have been staying in on their border and are housing them in nearby warehouses. And not a moment too soon. This man from Iraq says that he tried to go to Lithuania with his friends, but security forces on both sides of the border treated them very badly. Another Iraqi told us his wife won't go back to Europe because she saw too many horrors on the border. One humanitarian group told Reuters that a man and woman it found had told them their one-year-old died in the forest. The Belarus government says it will agree to fly back 5,000 migrants to their home countries, but only if they agree to go voluntarily. They won't force anyone, they say. They want the European Union to take 2,000 migrants on their side. The spokesperson for Belarus, President Lukashenko, he had discussed the proposal with German Chancellor Merkel. But the EU has previously said there will be no negotiation with him. And although some migrants are agreeing to go home, others are still making fresh attempts to cross the heavily guarded border.
Meanwhile, Belarus media are reporting its government is no longer allowing citizens from several war-torn or troubled countries to board flights for Belarus from Uzbekistan. It includes Afghans, Iraqis, and Syrians. Tennis star Peng Shui is at the center of growing concern. Earlier this month, she alleged that China's former vice premier, Xiang Gao Li, sexually assaulted her. 35-year-old Peng is the former world number one in doubles and has not been seen since. In the latest, the United Nations has stepped in and has demanded proof of the whereabouts of the Chinese tennis star. The UN Rights Office has called for a fully transparent investigation into Peng's claims. The Women's Tennis Association threatened to pull out of China over concerns about Peng Shui. WTA Chairman Steve Simon said that he's willing to lose millions of dollars worth of business in the lucrative Chinese market to ensure Peng's safety. The WTA threat comes a day after the Chinese tennis star reportedly released an email, details of which have been questioned. China's state-run media outlet published screenshots of the email on Twitter, where Peng claims that accusations of sexual abuse are not true and were released without her consent. She also claims that she is resting at home and that everything is fine. On social media, doubts were quickly flagged about the language used in the purported email. According to Chinese media, Peng has sent the email to Women's Tennis Association chairman Steve Simon, who said that he had a hard time believing what Peng wrote in the email. Simon said he was struggling to believe that the mail was authentic. He's called for independent and verifiable proof that Peng is safe. In a briefing, when asked about Peng Shui's condition, the Chinese Foreign Ministry spokesman dodged the question. On November the 2nd, Peng posted on China's Twitter-like site Weibo allegations of sexual assault against the former vice premier. Her post was soon deleted, but not before social media users took screenshots of it. Her post then went viral on Twitter, which is banned in China. Hashtag Where is Peng Shui began to gain traction. Tennis players across the world have also voiced concern about Peng. Tennis champions, including Naomi Osaka and Novak Djokovic, earlier said that they were shocked and deeply concerned about her condition. Serena Williams is the latest tennis star to voice concern on the whereabouts of Peng. She took to Twitter and said that she is devastated and shocked to hear about Peng. Williams added that the matter must be investigated and we must not stay silent. But China has so far remained silent on the matter. Peng still comes up on search results online in China, but her allegations do not. Well, South Koreans love their beaches. It's their favourite spot to catch a breath between their fast-paced lives. They're fond of the calm, blue, crystal waters. But now, as the planet continues to warm, dozens of beaches in South Korea fear complete erosion. Our next report tells you more. This is the Sashionjin Beach, a favoured spot for vacationers and surfers. Shining sun, glistening sand, and crystal blue waters. But then, climate change struck, and the coast known for calm winds has now started witnessing tumultuous waters. In August, high waves washed away major portions of the shore, a trend that locals say is getting more frequent with every passing day. The waters have never been this close, nor the waves this high for the past 12 years. This place was famous for calm waves, but look, they are wildly breaking now. South Korea's fast economic expansion is eating away its beaches.
Well, as we heard there, climate full swing, and despite renewed and ambitious pledges, the situation on the ground remains alarming. African forest ele elephants are critically endangered already, and the forests of Gabon in central Africa happen to be the last remaining fortress for the African forest tuskers. We'll leave you with this report. Thanks, as always, for watching. This year has witnessed extreme climate events, devastating wildfires, floods and soaring temperatures. Not to forget that this year also witnessed the ambitious pledges at the COP20 summit. But was it a success? Well, the jury is still out on that. Loss of habitat has had a devastating impact on animals. One of its victims is the African forest elephant. For these tuskers, climate change has degraded the forest quality. Poaching, land encroachment and even conflict in the neighboring countries such as Cameroon, Democratic Republic of Congo and Central African Republic has had devastating impact on the natural habitat of the African elephant. We've done a lot of work educating people about the protected status of elephants and so the Gabonese people tend to respect um, elephants and not kill them. Identifying elephants in the region is a tall task. The elephants are identified with the help of DNA from over a thousand samples. Gabon is home to 80% of the world's remaining African forest elephant population and has invested incrementally in sustainable forestry, which has helped increase the elephant population here by 50% since the last census in the 1990s. While there is an improvement in numbers, Researchers have urged the government and other countries to step up conservation efforts. Bureau report, we on, world is one.